Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. You know, I've seen the redwoods out in the, in the west and the sequoias, and this is, this is the middle part of the country's version of that. It's, it's, it's endurance and it's continuity, and it's also future because that tree is going to be around well after us. When nature presents something this massive and grand, it's a splendor that you have to live up to. Some people say classical music, let's let it die, let's let it go in the past. My opinion is, let's commandeer it and take a new, new look at it as well. Honor the tradition, and we're doing that with groups like Early Music Missouri. This thing has endured, you know, all of the, so much of the test of time, and yet we are here for just a short period. So it, it was one of those things, it was intimidating, but yet inspiring. This is St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jonathan All. On a recent weekday morning, just after a heavy night of rain had cleared, Jody Red Edge Ferber lugged a cello down a grassy hill in Webster Groves. Her friend and fellow musician Walter Parks unfolded a chair for her, situating it beneath an enormous, centuries-old oak tree, and then Furrer began playing. She found that the natural amphitheater tucked between a quiet neighborhood street and a local park provided excellent inspiration for some freestyle playing. I mean, I have to tell you, I, I, I don't think I can ever think of a time in my life when I've played this close to a babbling brook before. I don't think, I don't think ever. It's, 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 it's like white noise. It's strangely calming and relaxing. Like you can kind of tap into that. I started um, with just the opening A section of the Sarabond from the third box suite, the C major box suite. Maybe this is a crazy idea, but that certain places inspire certain modes of you. Certain tonalities are certain modes. I mean, I'm sitting under a 350-year-old oak tree and by a babbling brook. It's, you know, it's, a, it's unique. <laughs> it's unique where I am right now. It's, it felt right to improvise. It felt right to do something that hasn't been done before. That's local cellist Jody Rededge Ferber. The reason she was checking out the outdoor venue was because of something else that's about to happen for the first time. Webster Groves' Baroque Baroque Festival. And joining me now to tell us more is another locally based musician, guitarist Walter Parks. Walter, welcome back to the show. Jonathan, thank you so much for having me here. Can you tell us a little bit about how you found this place and how you had the idea we need to make some music under that big tree. A year ago, my wife and I bought a house in Webster Groves. We had been living in New York City area, in Jersey City. And Margo, my wife, is from Webster Groves. When the COVID hit, we thought, we can't, we can't stay the course in New York. We have to move and help her parents see through the COVID. So we came and we bought a house, coincidentally, right on the edge of Larson Park, right behind the the liberty oak tree and our house our lawn sloped down essentially towards the tree and between our house and the tree was larson park and we thought this is a natural place for a concert no concerts had ever been done there and i thought i wonder if we can kind of brainstorm this and present it to the city of webster groves we did after much thought and they love the idea so here we are 
why uh, why baroque music was there something about that or was it just the play on words of bur oak baroque or? jonathan you you got me there i mean you know it, it, you know if 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 there if the tree had been named uh, the something that rhymed with hip hop we might have been calling it the hip hop festival but this the 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 impetus for it was inspired by the pun there was a plaque at the foot of the tree that says liberty oak it was here when the declaration of independence was signed in 17 1776, and it, they described the tree as a burr oak, and the light went off in my head, burr oak, baroque. We have to do baroque music. Now, I, I love baroque music, and I started playing music, even though I'm a guitarist in the kind of swampy blues and spiritual style now, I started playing viola when I was a kid. So I've loved baroque music all my life, but never played it professionally, and I thought it, it's a natural in this setting, so... And Baroque music uh, written about 1600 to 1750. The big right. names would be people like Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, Telemann, mm -hmm. just to give people some kind of sense of what we're talking about. Right. And, and I, I'm probably, I'm, I'm not a classical music expert, but I would, I'm going to go out of limb here. I think this is the most accessible and, if you will, almost popish of the classical repertoire. I mean, we lump this into classical music, but classical historians would say that classical music per se didn't start until around 1750, and before that came Baroque. But these, these pieces of music are concise. They, for the most part, they last only about three minutes long, and they have really grabbable, understandable melodies. They're not too complex, and that's you know, for that's one of the things I've always liked about them. I, I also baroque. It was an incredibly flexible form of music because a lot of things were played on different instruments. It's not some like when Mozart wrote a horn concerto, it was intended to be played on horn. But when Telemann wrote something, it was played by two of whatever you had. Yeah. There was a lot more flexibility to it. And, and it also uh, had uh, elements of improvisation, as we heard uh, from Jody speak about. I wonder if that also kind of plays to a natural surrounding, having music that maybe is a little less rulesy. I don't think that's a word. Is that a word? Rulesy. No? Okay. Well, well yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it. It's fine. Um, I... I was surprised. I learned when in, in presenting this concert and putting it together that there was this improvisational aspect. So, you know, this, this is new to me. And one of our dancers, uh, Julia Bankston, who's from Sweden but now lives in New York, said that she, at the very tail end of our performance next Friday night, she wants to do an improv, an improv dance over one of these little repeating loops. So what what you're in, what you've inspired me to think about right now, there is some contemporary similarity in a way to a lot of these these baroque improvs are done over four chord or four note melody loops and they just keep looping the same the same bass line and then the musicians play and uh, just sort of make it up on the spot in a sense right there and I never knew that about Baroque music, but that's that's going to be our finale, as, as a matter of fact. We asked uh, Jody uh, Redders-Ferber about what she hopes attendees will be able to take away from the concert. It's on July 16th, and, and here's what she told us. I think enchantment. I think that this is it's an enchanting um, interweaving of ideas and music all coming together and, and at the same time. So... It's a, it's a really creative event where here we are in front of a 350-year-old oak tree and we're going to be hearing music that's 400 years old, 350 years old, 300 years old, um, as well as some creative twists on that music. So some of the artists, including my husband and his twin brother and I who are playing, um, and Walter, we're going to be doing some creative reimaginings of that Baroque music from hundreds of years ago, kind of bringing in influences and in sound worlds that are very 2021 into it, doing our own twists. Jody added that Baroque music really lends itself to these reinventions. Just the, the, under, the fundamental structure, the way that that music is written, it's, it's full of so much for musicians to take now. So many just 
fundamental nuts and bolts that we can take and play with and reinvent and make our own. It's so rich. It's, it's incredibly rich and fertile terrain to keep working with. Walter, what I'm hearing there is that there's beauty and complexity and simplicity. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing from that. And it's, it's, it's wonderful for people who are not heavy into to classical music. And, you know, you know if, you're, if you're worried about it being too complicated or whatever, this is the music for you. And, and I come from more of a, a pop and, and rock and roll and bluesy background, for instance. But I can hear a lot of James Taylor. I can hear a lot of, you know, almost the beginnings of some of Scott Joplin's music. He was from here. Maybe I, I have a feeling that he grabbed from classical music and did his own thing with it, which would later become jazz. So, you know, it, it, it's really it's exciting and it's it's tangible to me. But what I love is that we're also open. Some people say classical music. Let's let it die. Let's let it go in the past. But we're also my my opinion is let's commandeer it and take a new new look at it as well. Honor the tradition, and we're doing that with groups like Early Music Missouri, playing lutes and therabos and that kind of thing. But we're also taking the, the, the dancers from Webster University are interpreting versions, modern electronic versions of Baroque music done by William Orbit, who produced Madonna. So we're taking you from lutes to the producer of Madonna, and, you know, through local and talent all over the country, we're interpreting this ancient music form. I want to talk about the dancers because that I find that incredibly intriguing. How did you decide to add a dance element to a music concert? Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm going to answer your question honestly. And I think that if music, live music is to survive, it needs to have a visual component to it. Um, we're in competition with cell phones. We're in competition with, you know, big movie screens and so on. So I think the dance component gives a survival aspect to live music, especially classical music. Some could say that's pandering to it. Just stick with the, the tradition and the purity of it. But Baroque dance was an integral part of Baroque music and that whole period. So what Julia... Uh, Bingston is doing is she's taking Baroque dance gestures and Baroque dance poses and reimagining them in a contemporary way. And that's exactly what she did at a concert in Carnegie Hall right before the COVID hit that my wife Margot presented as well. So we're, we've got three musicians who were at Carnegie Hall just before the COVID hit that we produced in, in Wheel Hall in Carnegie. So this is some pretty impressive talent. Well, and a lot of those uh, Baroque pieces of music, um, they have the names of the movements are the names of dances like minuet or sarabande yeah. or waltz or things like that. So so the, it, it really even when maybe the dance element isn't as common because we hear the music more, right. it was written at least informed by dance. And probably, you know what, you, you may know more about it than me <laughs> on this, but I, it seems like these things were written to be dances. But. You're listening to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jonathan Allen for Sarah Fenske. We're speaking with Walter Parks. Uh, who is behind the Webster Grove's Baroque Baroque Festival, which is on July 16th under a beautiful old tree in Webster Groves. Um, I want to hear from our cellist one more time. Uh, we uh, Earlier we heard Jody uh, talk about a reinvention of Baroque music, and, and here's Jody again with just a fantastic example. This is the Courant movement from the third box suite, the suite for solo cello in C major. And although you're just hearing me right now, when we perform it at Baroque Baroque, there will also be a drummer playing with me and my husband on trombone. And we've, we're doing a creative reimagining of this uh, where it's in an Afro-Cuban style, Afro-Cuban rhythm, which uh, basically means that we're mining the cross rhythm out of this. Um, so it's a two against three feel. And the drummer's gonna keep messing around, whether he kind of um, accentuates a two beat or if he's gonna accentuate a three beat. And uh, it makes it, I mean, this is really fun to play on solo cello. And it's even more enormously fun to play with the drums <laughs> and a challenge for me. So this is the Courant. 
That's just beautiful. Uh, a courant, a 16th century court dance, and there were a lot of them in Baroque music. So I'm really, I, I'd love to see how this is going to be with drums and an Afro-Cuban beat. It sounds really fascinating. It's, again, it's giving it new life. It's saying, this is the future. It's like we're listening we're listening to the future that, you know, we're, 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 and, and I just, we're taking from the past, we're reowning history and we're saying, where are we going with this? And I feel like we're giving it, we're giving it new life. And I just love that. And who does that with Bach? It's just, I, I'm, I'm excited about it. And, and I, I want to say just, just in case we get a, a big rain, and maybe you were going to ask this, but I just was thinking because I'm seeing clouds out the window. <laughs> if we get a big rain and it just looks like we can't do this outside, we've, we've arranged to, to have it indoors at the Ozark Theater in Webster. But y'all check in with the website, Burr Oak, and that's B U double R O A K Baroque dot com the day of or social media or something just to make sure. But if it's just misty out, I think we're going to try to do it in the, in the, 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 the outdoor setting. Well, let, let's talk about the tree for a little bit. Um, it is the Liberty tree as it has been named. Um, and we're going to have right. to go into a little bit of theater of the mind here to talk about just how awesome it is over the radio. Um, its circumference is 15 and a half feet. So, Put that in your mind's eye. Mm-hmm. It's 84 feet tall, and the the spread of the branches is more than 120 feet. Mm-hmm. I, I, I our producer who stopped by the other day attests that it is in fact absolutely massive, which is a technical term, but I think we one we can all get behind. <laughs> but I, what when you first saw this tree, what what did you think and feel? I felt. I, I had a, a, a spiritual grabbing, honestly. I mean, I just, I thought, well, first of all, the tree, you can't tell it from right where the tree is, but the tree is directly behind the confluence of two streams. Now, to me, where two streams or two rivers come together, like the Missouri and the Mississippi here, where, t- where two little bodies of water come together, I think that's an important place. It just seems really magical. It, it to Jonathan, it I thought this when nature presents something this massive and grand, it's a splendor that you have to live up to in the way you conduct your life. This thing has endured you know all of the so much of the test of time, and yet we are here for just a short period. so it it was one of those things. It was intimidating, but yet inspiring. Um, I just. I mean, that sounds like it sounds in a certain way like psychobabble, but I just I felt like I have to try to do something to live up to the natural grandeur of this, and what has mankind done, and the baroque baroque thing kind of made sense in a way. The music is so powerful and inspiring. I thought they sort of go together, um, and I just thought this is something we got to protect. This this is a a creek bed and a river bank that we have to protect. And this is a tree that we have to protect. We have to prune it when it's necessary and try to keep it alive as long as possible. And because when I sit and I take a moment to just sit beneath that tree or on top of the hill, it, it, it just realigns my thoughts. It makes my life just a little better when I take my dogs out there and just sit down. And that's what we're hoping that the tree can do for y'all when you come out and hear this music. Now, while that word picture is better than anything I could come up with, if you'd actually like to see a picture of the tree, our Twitter feed and our Facebook page have pictures of the tree so that you do get to see it. But it's still, even a picture has got to be no comparison to actually being under it. 
Yeah, and it's you know I've seen the redwoods out in the in the west and the sequoias, and this is this is the middle part of the country's version of that. It's 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 endurance and it's continuity, and it's also future because that tree is going to be around well after us. And what what, what are your what kind of hopes do you th- have for turnout? I mean, how how I'm not familiar with the area. How many people can you have there? Well. If, I, I, you, as a performer, I played all over the world with Richie Havens. Richie was the guy who opened the Woodstock Festival. And we used to play in, in community-type ven- venues like this in public parks. I, in this space, I've seen, I've seen up to like 500 people in, in that kind of a space comfortably. You could fit more uncomfortably. But we're hoping that people kind of space themselves out and be mindful of the, still the, the lingering COVID a little bit. And um, so that's what I think. I mean, I, I would be delighted if we got that many. We're, it, it could fit that comfortably. And, um, but it, again, it's on a sloping it's, – it's on a hill, so there's no, there's no bad seats. And the, the stage is not really going to be raised. The stage is down at the bottom of it all. So every it, it's almost like seeing Shakespeare in the park or something at Muni or or something like that. So anyway, well, I, I know that you have a big festival coming up, and all of your focus is definitely on making sure it goes very very well. Yeah. But as as we do, what would be next if this comes off as well as you'd like? Do you have an idea of what you would do next? Yes, my my wife and I. My, my wife is named Margot Parks, and she's we both have presenting concerts in our blood. We just, I did it when I was in school at University of Georgia. She did it at NYU in New York. And she, she had the idea to maybe continue the tree theme and go with burr oak roots if this is a success. Because, you know, let's face it, Baroque music is, is European in nature, and the concept of having a roots festival, then that brings in spirituals, that brings in, that brings in this area of the world. The whole story of, you know, the great migration from the south to the north and all of that music, acoustic music, folk music, I mean, the, where, where that could go, if, if Baroque, Baroque is a success, we're looking towards Baroque roots, and, and we'll, but who knows, I'm Really, really happy you brought that up. I hope it's a success. Success. The uh, it's uh, July sixteenth. Yes, seven thirty p.m. Um, parking in the downtown area. I would I would suggest that because the, the little street that we kind of live Oak Street, which is the nearest street, is kind of like a. It's like it reminds me of San Francisco or a, a Cisco or something. It's really kind of a quaint and artsy sort of street. There's not much parking there. Park down in an old Webster near Straub's, and there's some public parking in that area. Uh, maybe eat dinner in the, with those restaurants down there. Eat early, and then take a ten minute walk to the Larson Park. And do not try to park on Oak Street. It's just going to get too crowded. And but it's it, if it's a nice night or even a light, a, a misty night, it'll be wonderful. And uh, encourage people to pack a picnic basket. Picnic and. Please bring some mosquito repellent or insect repellent. Um, picnic, bring something to drink, whatever you want, um, and uh, and a mat maybe. And in case if the fl- if the ground is a little bit damp, you know, bring a little blanket or something like that as well. Is what? there is there any mindset you'd like people to come with? Wow, that is that is great, and I I would just like them to be willing to to turn off their cell phones and be open. Be open to, to, to surprise. Be open to what the tree can give them. And I'm not talking about tree hugger type stuff. I'm talking about the tree. If, if you stare at something long enough, you're going to see things in it that you never saw in that first glance. And I promise you, that tree and that setting and this Baroque music will provide you something that that is an inspiration and will make in a short hour visit or a two hour visit your life better in a small way. Be open to just taking in nature and taking in this marvelous art and, um, and being grateful for 
St. Louis Public Radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm grateful that you joined us today, Walter. Thank you so much. Walter Parks, the Baroque Baroque Festival, next Friday evening at 7.30 p.m. in Webster Groves. Thank you so much for being with us. Jonathan, Walter. my pleasure. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.